Good morning, if you are in the West Coast, like I am. Uh, good afternoon, if you are in the East Coast, like uh, all of our speakers today. And good evening, if you are joining us from uh, further away, uh, Europe or Turkey or the Ottoman realm of once upon a time. Uh, my name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis. I convene the uh, Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association's online events. And today, let me start uh, with sharing my screen for you to see uh, the introduction for today, all of us together. Give me one second there. Here we go. Today we are here uh, for an OTSA co-op meeting. Uh, we have a series of meetings called What's Up? What's Up in Ottoman and Turkish Studies that we do every month. And then we also have two other series, uh, one of them called Turkey Now, one of them called the OTSA Co-op that we do occasionally. Today we are meeting here to talk about uh, a textbook writing a short history of the Ottoman Empire and then teaching it in the classroom. Um, I will introduce uh, our speakers uh, in a minute, but before I do so, uh, let me tell you just a bit about ne our next programming in case you haven't heard. On Monday, we have our What's Up meeting for um, this month, February. Uh, and we will host uh, Tiana Kristic and Dirin Terzioğlu, who will chair a session on their uh, European Research uh, Commission funded project, uh, the Otto Confession. Uh, and they'll talk about a little bit about the edited volume they did, and they'll talk about uh, other things that they're working on or at the moment to finish. And they, others from their team will be participating as well. You can see all of their names right here. Paulina Ivanova, MS uh, Muntan, Anna Ohanjanian, Mir Shapir, and Hassan Umut. Uh, next month in March, we have a WhatsApp meeting on March uh, 25th. And there uh, we will talk about a book. Uh, it's a book panel on a companion to early modern Istanbul in commemoration of Yavuz Sezer, whom we had lost uh, about a year ago to COVID. Um, his friends and colleagues approached us to start a, a prize in his name. And that, as you know, uh, passed uh, the, in the recent ballot. And so we will announce that uh, prize in our prize cycle this year. And at this event, we will formally thank to uh, the people who donated to make that uh, prize possible. And we are planning to do also a little fundraising around it for the first time. So uh, if you, you know, uh, keep an eye on your email, you should see an email in early March about that. Uh, now, for today, let me start with our uh, main uh, presenter, our, we are featuring Rene Warringer's uh, textbook. Uh, Rene Warringer is an associate professor at the University of Delft. And those of you who are familiar uh, with Ottoman history, you would know her from the book that she edited, The Islamic Middle East and Japan, and her uh, monograph on Ottomans imagining Japan, East, Middle East, and non-Western modernity at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, she'll talk about her uh, book, the most recent one, the textbook, A Short History of the Ottoman Empire, uh, right after I finish the introductions. Um, then we'll have three colleagues who taught this very recently published book last fall in their classrooms. Evren Altuntash is a visiting assistant professor of history at the University of Gelb. He's also a Mesa Global Academy fellow in this academic year. And he recently took over uh, one of the editorship roles at H. Turk, for which I am truly grateful to Evren. H. Turk is actually, in a way, the communication tool of OTSA, was established back in the day as a listserv for Turkish Studies Association members. And today, it uh, reaches to thousands of people around the globe uh, 
announced for announcing books, conferences, uh, uh, prizes, you name it. Uh, he used to be an assistant professor at Artvin Çoruh University, and uh, it, he was forced to resign. You might have heard a lot about uh, the signatories of the peace petition who lost their jobs, but uh, Turkish academia had problems before that as well. Evren uh, Altintash is one of our colleagues who had experienced a lot of pressures and mobbing after the Gezi incident. Um, after the Gezi, uh, there was a, a sort of a government crackdown on activists in many universities that didn't get as much coverage as uh, later crackdowns uh, on uh, academics uh, did. So Evren is a in a sense, a victim of that moment. Uh, he's been teaching at uh, the University of Delft since 2018 as a visiting uh, assistant professor. And his research areas are in the history of the Middle East, Turkish history, intellectual history, and the transformation from Ottoman Empire to modern Middle East and Turkey. He has several articles and book chapters uh, published. Next, uh, we will uh, hear from uh, our colleague, Janet Klein, who teaches uh, at the University of Akron. Uh, you all know her from her book, uh, The Margins of Empire, Kurdish Militias in the Ottoman Tribal Zone. Um, and last but uh, not least, we go alphabetically in this order, uh, Mustafa Minavi, uh, he teaches at uh, Cornell University, and there uh, he is also the director of Ottoman and post-Ottoman studies. His first book, The Ottoman Scramble for Africa, Empire and Diplomacy in the Sahara and the Hejaz, has been translated to Turkish and Arabic. His current book project, Losing Istanbul, Arab Ottoman Imperialists and the End of Empire, is forthcoming with Stanford University Press later this year. Inshallah, uh, you never know whether it will come out right later this year, but that's why I added to Inshallah. And I'll stop right here. Uh, Renee, please go on. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction and thanks to everybody uh, who's here today. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope. Yeah, okay. Um, I actually want to begin by acknowledging that the University of Guelph is located on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples and the treaty lands and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation people. I offer gratitude to the indigenous ancestors who resided here and to all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples across Canada and North America. Um, so uh, I guess the, the first question people would ask is, how did I go about writing this? Um, I was actually approached by the University of Toronto Press a few years earlier about doing a text on nationalism in the Middle East. And it, it never really materialized. And, um, and then um, the a, a textbook editor contacted me from the same press asking if I would be interested in writing a textbook on uh, the Ottoman Empire's history and it would fit into their series, A Short History Of. There's a short history of the Middle Ages, a short history of the Renaissance, and they're used quite frequently for teaching uh, European history here. So um, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of put to paper how I like to teach my class. And it is a class that um, I have a lot of students who know little to nothing about the early Islamic world. They know little to nothing about the Middle East, um, it, you know, in the medieval, early modern or modern eras. So. I, I really felt we did need a single text that was sort of readable for students, but also, you know, interesting for non-specialist audiences as well uh, in academia. So, and I found I had to, when I was teaching my class, um, there's some books that, you know, I've used in the past that worked or didn't work for various reasons. So I, I felt that it was important to, to try and, and, and uh, take on this task. It was a monumental task. And I can probably thank just about everybody who's in this talk today for, um, assisting me because I, I, you know, I was a late Ottoman historian and, and I suddenly was um, trying to talk about the entire Ottoman Empire. And so I thank you all for, for guiding me. Um, some of you I named in my acknowledgements and some I did not, but I appreciated everybody's work. So um, I did feel that it was important to include a brief overview of pre-Ottoman history. Um, and I have my reasons for that, but I think, Janet, you're going to talk about that a little bit later as well, so I'll, I'll leave that for now. We can have a discussion about that, about whether or not it belongs in, a, in an Ottoman history text. 
Um, what I did want to just tell you about, in, instead of trying to go through all the chapters or something, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about the structure of the chapters that were heavily influenced by having taught three, um, having taught Ottoman history in three different countries, actually, over the course of my academic career. And I interacted with a lot of different faculty and students that I, I really learned from as well. The first time I taught um, Ottoman history was at the University of Minnesota as a recent PhD, and I was a Woodrow Wilson fellow there from 2002 to 2003. And I had the pleasure there of working with Taner Akjam, who was a guest professor there at the time. And he and Eric Weitz, a German historian, um, hosted the third of those closed workshops on the Armenian Turkish scholarship. The workshop number three was called Vectors of Violence, War, Revolution, and Genocide. That happened in March of 2003, and I just happened to, to be there at the time. Um, they were rather closed meetings, but I was able to attend, and it really broadened my understanding of how to approach and teach this issue of the Armenian genocide in the classroom. From this experience, I realized I wanted to present a discussion of the Armenian genocide that was sort of missing from a lot of the previous Ottoman histories that I had been using, but I also wanted to illustrate the suffering of people generally in World War I and the recognition of it by more than just, you know, the Western missionaries and the diplomats, right, and the, the problems in those sources. So this is why, for example, um, I included um, actions and recollections from other Muslims uh, at the time. And this is also why there's uh, a brief excerpt from Irfan Orga's um, uh, mem memoir about his childhood in wartime Constantinople. And that, that's what, you know, made it into its textbook for that for that reason. Um, I then, you know, I taught at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia uh, for about four years. I was a junior lecturer there from 2003 to 2007. And I, you know, I taught Ottoman history to students who were rather ignorant of, of um, who the Anzacs, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, were fighting against at the Dardanelles in World War I. It was there where I realized the profound sense of the bond that was created by the Gallipoli campaign of 1915 for Australians, for New Zealanders, and for Turks um, as their mutual national awakening through sacrifice and battles. And it was the coming of age for Britain's colonies as much as it was for uh, Turks and the crowning of their national war hero, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. So interestingly, it was, on, uh, it was in Australia on the annual Anzac Day, which is April 25th. Uh, in 2005, it was the 90th anniversary of the Battle of Gallipoli, and it drew particular attention for me. I became keenly aware that day that Australians, New Zealanders, and Turks were all gathering at Gallipoli to commemorate this day. Locally, um, in cities across Australia, parades and demonstrations were occurring, and Armenians had just done their annual commemoration of the genocide the day before, on April 24th. And of course, the day before that, on April 23rd, is um, Turkish National Sovereignty and Children's Day that commemorates the establishment of the Grand National Assembly. So April is a big month uh, for, for all of those countries, and it really brought that home for me. And now here in Canada, I teach Ottoman history as a third year course uh, in one short 12 week semester. Um, sometimes I'm very grateful it's only 12 weeks, but it also means a whole lot of material has to be covered very rapidly. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of students who have plenty of curiosity and enthusiasm for learning about the Ottoman Empire, but few chances to really acquire that knowledge beyond my classroom. Uh, there's a persistent tendency to leave the Ottomans out of much of European history discussions. And, you know, they've heard about fratricide, they've heard about the Janissaries, but not a whole lot else, actually, when they get when they first come to my class. Most students only know about the modern Middle East and its politics based on what they hear in the news. They know almost nothing about how the map we see today became what it is. Um, nor do they then realize the vast reach of the Ottoman state in so many regions of the world, something I tried to illustrate through the many maps and chapter sections exploring the Ottoman footprint, east, west, across uh, the Northern Arc, as well as in the Southern tier. And, you know, understanding the 18th and 19th century Ottoman-Russian relations in the so-called Northern Arc is of course even more timely given Russia's current invasion of, Afghan of uh, Ukraine. So lastly, I should thank my Canadian students uh, who allowed me to test drive the chapters as I was writing them. 
They provided critiques and feedback. They showed me, they showed me what, what interested them and what confused them. Um, I had students who did reviews of the chapters as writing assignments, and it, it gave them the experience of writing a review while also getting feedback um, from the intended audience. So it was really helpful for me. They helped me write as much as several of the Ottomanist friends and colleagues who, who read and commented on early drafts. Some of you are here today. Um, and there were anonymous reviewers as well from University of Toronto Press who really went over it with a fine tooth comb and made my chapters more precise. Um, University of Toronto Press initially thought about doing a separate primary source reader to accompany it, and they asked me about that. Um, they've done this with other books in that series, uh, but eventually several of the reviewers uh, suggested against that idea, and actually I think it was probably a good idea because there's been several collections now that have come out, um, Menage, the Menage uh, Ottoman Documents one, um, there's the source, what is it called, the Source Book of Ottoman History, um, the one that's, it's, uh, it primarily is the early uh, period that it's, it's an ebook that is actually. The Ottoman World, a Cultural History Reader. Our last co-op meeting was about that book. Okay, yeah, that's, that, there's that one, but then there's one before that too. There was one, ah, I, 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 I'm blanking on it at the moment, I'm sorry. But it's, it's actually, I know Halil Berktai was one of the editors of it, and there were several other scholars from uh, the Balkan region and they put together a, a whole volume of translated materials. So I, I used that one in, until that, the Ottoman documents came out, the one that we're you, you just mentioned that, that we had to talk on. So, um, so um, I had a couple of grad students who worked for me briefly you know, to help me find images and, and things. I had a wonderful map maker when I needed a map that, um, that I couldn't really find readily. So, um, I think I'm, you know, I'm not going to say anything more because I want to let the people who actually used it say more uh, about it, and we can have a bit of a conversation at the end. So, um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you so much, Rune. Uh, everyone, please uh, tell us about how it went at the University of Guelph last fall. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, first of all. Uh, I would like to begin with a very uh, interesting point that I experienced because uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Turkish citizen, I was uh, being taught at Turkey in primary school, secondary school, and it, at university about the Ottoman history. And in addition to that, during my master's and PhD uh, education, I, I learned from the professors in Turkey by different articles and books, etc. And when I became an assistant professor, I used to teach Ottoman history in Turkey. And I also taught in Cyprus. In Cyprus, my students were from different uh, countries, from various countries, from uh, Eastern Europe and, and Middle East. And uh, the, the problem I had when I was uh, teaching Ottoman history to a group of students who had no familiarity with the history of the Ottomans was uh, that I had to use multiple resources for that. I mean, I had to use multiple books, multiple articles, some online references. I mean, and I needed to provide them an additional guide while I was teaching this course. And what uh, really differed for me uh, uh, last semester while I was teaching uh, as and using Rene's book as the main textbook was I, I didn't need to provide any additional sources to the students because they already had the book and also the, the references and all the bibliography at the end of chapters. So uh, that was the course for me with the least amount of additional reference requests. And the only ones I had were for the uh, presentations the students had, had to do throughout the semester. I organized two presentations called the Ottoman Sultan's Day and the Ottoman People Day, in which students were either the sultans uh, or uh, uh, people from specific occupations within the Ottoman society. And most of the references they used were from the book. And the book, in general, gave us the chance, and me and the students, the chance to widen our perspective about the Ottomans. So, uh, for instance, all the previous books I used were either focusing on military 
history of the Ottomans or specifically on cultural history or the diplomatic history or the economic history, but Rene's book is covering all of these main themes. And it was a very good opportunity for me to uh, use this textbook and uh, to enlighten the students who had no previous knowledge about uh, the Ottoman history at all, or the previous knowledge they had uh, was limited with some prejudices or some, uh, sorry to say that basic Wikipedia knowledge. So, and it was therefore very useful uh, in that sense. Also, uh, the maps and figures in the book were very useful for the students. So, because sometimes it's really hard to find a very uh, comprehensive map or figure to show the students and everything was already in the book. They read the chapters before coming to class and they were very much aware of what I was talking about, which is one of the most important uh, issues uh, we as instructors of Middle Eastern or Ottoman history face uh, while teaching a group of North American students without any preliminary knowledge about the region. Also the boxes Rene used were like the boxes I would use and I used before, I mean, as additional uh, topics in any Ottoman classes, like the Osman's dream, for instance, was one of them. I really enjoyed uh, having the chance to provide the students this uh, textbook and they were able to read it. Or Epic of Sheikh Bedrettin by Nazim Hikmet, for instance, which is a great contribution uh, to the understanding of students. Also, the letters between Selim and Ismail or the Sabatai Zivi movement, which is a very unique case in the Ottoman history and also in the Jewish history, which also shows the, uh, the level of tolerance the Ottomans have uh, towards uh, any religious movements within the country. Uh, Zabatai Sevi movement and the box, box about it was also very useful. And in addition to that, I'm, I'm just going to uh, finish. Uh, the, at the end of the semester, uh, I had a free week. So I did a histor histor his comparative history, comparative uh, textbook. Uh, session with the students. So what I did was I took some of the Turkish uh, Ottoman uh, textbooks that are predominantly used in uh, Turkish curriculum, and I translated them into English. And then I put a page from Rene's book, and they had a chance to compare and contrast and to understand the level of knowledge they had uh, from this class with the help of this wonderful textbook. And finally, uh, I'm teaching modern Middle East this semester at University of Guelph. And some of my students who had taken the Ottoman history are now in this class. And we are using some chapters from Rene's book in the first couple of weeks. And now uh, I, I started to receive their feedbacks because I provide a small box for them on the uh, interface we use for communication. And they, the ones who took the Ottoman history course are now giving, providing me feedback and telling me that what they learned in the Ottoman uh, history about Ottoman history previous semester in fall 2021 and the book and the content is now very useful for them to understand the modern Middle East history. And thanks to Rene, uh, it's a wonderful textbook that can be used for both classes. So that's what I'm going to say. Thank you very much. Evren, thank you so, so much for um, our sort of future watchers on YouTube. Let me share with you a message that was just shared on chat. Uh, so the title of the source book that Rene uh, couldn't remember just a minute ago, uh, our audience member Silvana uh, very kindly uh, provided that title for us, The Ottoman Empire, Workbook One, Teaching Modern Southeast European History, Alternative Education Materials, Halil Bakhtai, uh, edited by Halil Bakhtai and uh, Bogdan Murkescu. Um, and there is, if you Google this title, you'll find in Academia uh, a copy of it, or at least the beginning pages for sure. So now, Janet Klein, uh, it's your turn, Janet, please. Thank you, Baki, for organizing this and all of these other um, OTSA uh, WhatsApp um, 
events. I think they're they're really wonderful. And uh, thank you. And and I just um, we're we're really here to celebrate Renee's the publication of Renee's new book. Um, it's it's really great. And uh, so I'll just talk a little bit too about how I used it in the classroom. And um, so I guess I'll start by talking about how she opens the book in this very engaging way for, uh, for students. She opens with two very different descriptions of who the Ottomans were, um, both from what would end up being the final years of the empire's existence. And the first is an excerpt from the Ottoman Committee of Union and Progress's uh, party propaganda from 1910 that extols the virtues of Ottomanism, describing the Ottoman nation as, quote, a body created by the incorporation of various peoples, such as Turks, Arabs, Albanians, Kurds, Armenians, Greeks, Bulgarians, and Jews who possess different religions and nationalities. And um, this same quote uh, later suggests that differences of religion and faith should not hinder the creation of a nation because religion is a matter of the next world and uh, affairs of individuals with common interests are matters of this world. So then she follows that with um, a few years later, American ambassador uh, to the Ottoman Empire, Henry Morgenthau, who in contrast uh, characterized the Ottomans in exceedingly disparaging terms as bullies and cowards and opportunists and ab absolutely contemptuous of their Christian foes. So the question of who were the Ottomans, uh, as Renee points out in the opening of her book, um, has become a multi-layered query over uh, the last hundred years. And I think her excellent new text really explores who the Ottomans were historically and historiographically in remarkable depth for an introductory work, um, yet in a manner that my undergrads found really accessible and engaging. Um, and so just a little bit about my class. Uh, I teach at a state university. Um, it's a 400 level history course. So usually juniors and seniors, but because it's also a um, like global diversity tag in there, uh, I ended up having like five engineering students <laughs> this last semester when I taught it as well. And so um, some of these students had been exposed, had taken a course from me before, a course or two, and um, many others had not. And so this book was really effective for, for that range of students. Um, and, uh, and I even asked them before, you know, when I knew I would be, you know, offering my feedback on this in this uh, forum here, I emailed my students from the class and and asked for their feed, you know feedback and um, and they all really uh, found the book to be to be engaging and helpful and um, so you know it was um, it was a good experience for them. I ended up having the students read all the chapters in order. Um, I, I did assign a lot of other readings to flesh out the various themes and debates. Um, and so I found the organization of Renee's book to make sense for how I constructed the course. Um, the content of each chapter served really well as a springboard for us to uh, explore, you know, some of these themes in greater detail. And so I guess I've been teaching Ottoman history to undergrads for 18 years, uh, 16 years at the University of Akron. Uh, I think, <laughs> and for um, a year or two at the University of Montana before that, so both state universities. And this is the most comprehensive book, um, as, as uh, Evran mentioned. Um, it's, I found it to be the most comprehensive and engaging and accessible text that kind of can serve as the glue that holds the course together. And so, as I mentioned, the, the preface of the book um, walks the reader through these tropes of the terrible Turk and their historical context and how they were shaped, uh, how they shaped and were shaped by um, Orientalist scholarship. Um, also how Turkish nationalist historiography also emerged as problematic. 
Uh, Renee's introduction does a really good job of introducing students to key debates in Ottoman historiography, and she fleshes them out in later chapters. So, you know, they're not just like, here's a spot to talk about debates, and then we forget about them later. And students found that really helpful, because um, in a couple minutes, I'll just mention one of my assignments, and then I'll be done. Um, but students get to then see how these multiple themes connect to these wider debates throughout the course. Um, the introduction also has a brief but um, quite rich section on discussing uh, Ottoman sources um, and uh, used to research Ottoman history. And students, um, everyone mentioned uh, some of the text boxes um, students found it neat to see some of these primary sources uh, reproduced as tech, as other text boxes in various points in the text. And so some of these included, as everyone mentioned, uh, letters from Sultan Selim and, and Shah Ismail, um, the mid 15th century letter from Rabbi Yitzhak Tarfati to his Jewish co-religionists in Europe, uh, excerpts from Evliya Chelebi's Book of Travels, also Armenian Chauvet um, Tonoyan's survivor testimony. Uh, the maps were great. Um, the students really appreciated those as well as all the images um, and photographs uh, throughout the book that really helped bring, you know, the history alive for them. Um, I really liked that it included a discussion of imperial and cultural traditions that the Ottomans came to inherit um, and goes from there all the way, you know, chronologically, also somewhat thematically through the centuries of Ottoman history to end with an exploration of um, Ottoman legacies and Turkey's ghosts. Um, so previous textbooks that I used didn't cover that span. So I, I you know, found those difficulties as, as Evra mentioned as well. Uh, I think previously I had used most recently, um, like a couple years ago, Donald Quadert's uh, um, book, which is short and sweet and, and good, but you know, it's really 1700 to the present. And I had to do a lot of supplementing with that. So I appreciated um, the span of, of what she covered. Uh, I also really liked a chapter in the middle of the book that, that sort of broke from the chronological presentation to discuss human and animal life in the Ottoman Empire. Um, I paired that with uh, one of Alan Mikhail's, um, uh, you know, dog eat dog empire <laughs> uh, article. Um, the book has, as everyone also mentioned, a sometimes extensive reading list at the end of each chapter, which students who are doing their own research projects might find useful. Um, some students did find that it was difficult to follow all the names and terms, but I think that's pretty normal. Um, a little coaching on letting them know like what to focus on and you know where to where to focus their energies. Um, they found it wasn't such a problem because other readers really do appreciate, you know, these names and terms. And so lastly, um, I'll just mention my final paper for them. And for this, this my students watched the 2006 uh, History Channel production, Ottoman Empire War Machine. And using all the historiography that they'd explored throughout the semester, in Renee's book, as well as in uh, our additional readings, they offered a detailed critique of the documentary. And so in a testament to Renee's work, they drew frequently on her clear discussions of Ottoman historiography and debates in their papers. Um, and so I'm not gonna really talk much about my syllabus and additional readings now, but I can kind of save that for Q and A if anyone cares. <laughs> Thanks. Dana, thank you so, so much. Uh, I'm going to take a brief moment before passing the mic to Mustafa to uh, share two pieces that were shared on chat for the benefit of our future watchers on YouTube. Uh, the, someone brought uh, up to our attention another textbook that was published five years ago, Douglas Howard's uh, History of the Ottoman Empire. You can also Google this on uh, and find a preview of it on Google Books. 
And uh, my colleague, Linda Darling uh, from Arizona, she mentioned, she says, and I'm reading, we are also preparing reading Ottoman history as source book with a contract from Cambridge University Press, which will accompany textbooks like Warringer's and Howard's. There are still some months before submission. So if anybody would like to contribute to it, please email me at, and then uh, ldarling at email.arizona.edu, which you can also find on Google. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for sharing this. And I hope by the time it comes out, your source book will do an OPSA co-op session on that one. Thank you. Now, Mustafa, please go on. Thank you. Thank you, Baki. And um, it's really great to be here to see on my screen so many uh, names and faces that I haven't seen in a while. It makes me remember that we are part of a community, um, which is really important, <laughs> particularly in the last couple of weeks. Um, I uh, used Renee's uh, textbook uh, this past spring, and uh, uh, I had a really good experience. So I'm going to be very brief, uh, but uh, I will tell you about uh, how I used it, uh, which classes I used it for, and uh, um, what are some of the things that I loved about it, and some of the things I wish it's, it had that it didn't have. So um, I have been teaching Ottoman history for uh, 10 years now. Uh, so <laughs> nine, uh, nine here at Cornell University and one year at the American University of Beirut. Uh, I, uh, um, I, the, the, I teach Ottoman history as an introduction to the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is uh, 15 weeks, and then uh, a third year course, uh, this course is a freshman course, and then there's a, a third year course uh, that is uh, um, the, the continuation, which is Ottoman Empire 1800 to 1923. So I'm lucky enough to be able to teach it with, uh, it gives me a lot more time to get into some of the concepts uh, because I have it as a full year extension. Students do not have to take both. And those that take the 1800 to 1923 course do not need to have uh, the intro course as background because in both cases, I have usually three weeks of getting on the same page. Um, what I call getting on the same page to try and actually uh, introduce people that do not have any background about the Ottoman Empire or the Middle East or the Byzantine Empire to kind of more or less um, for us to get on the same page before we get into hardcore Ottoman issues. Um, I'm looking over here because I'm looking at my screen and my notes, so forgive me. Uh, so the, uh, this, uh, this textbook I used for my Intro to the Ottoman Empire class. Um, usually, uh, the students, uh, uh, I usually get somewhere between 25 and 55 students, depending on uh, um, uh, whether I've been, uh, whether I had a break in between teaching it. It's a lot of kind of word of mouth. So if they've been teaching it for three years, by the third year, you usually have about 50 students. Uh, uh, and it is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, at the beginning, it was surprising to me that how many students were interested in it, particularly that most of the students are not history students. Uh, um, the way the distribution works here at Cornell University is that uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the arts and science field, you have to take few courses that fill the quote unquote distribution. Uh, Ottoman history course is considered a world history and uh, pre-1800, uh, both of which the students have to take one off. So it kind of, it's a, uh, it fulfills both of these requ uh, requirements. So I end up with a lot of students that really are not in the humanities at all. Um, so a lot of pre-med, uh, basically it reflects the population at, uh, at Cornell, a lot of pre-med, a lot of engineering, uh, also some historians uh, in there as well. The reason I'm bringing this up is that I cannot assume that they know anything at all. Uh, um, that doesn't mean uh, some of them don't know some. Some come from fancy schools where they discuss Ottoman history in high school. Uh, um, but I cannot assume that they all come from fancy schools where Ottoman history is is, is acknowledged. Uh, for the most part, people really know very little. And as as Renee and Janet and um, and everyone said, most of them, their knowledge of uh, uh, Ottoman world is either from uh, uh, CNN, which is terrifying and um, or uh, uh, TV shows, which is terrifying in a different way. So um, the good thing is that a lot more people are interested in Ottoman history because of the TV shows, thankfully. 
so what the, the, all of this to say that by the time uh, I used uh, Renee's uh, book because in many ways it it paralleled the way I have been teaching uh, uh, the course uh, for a while, but using different sources. So I had to kind of cobble up uh, sources every year to try and cover uh, some of the topics that come together in this textbook, which is why I was so excited about it. Um, so it it saves me a lot of making sure that I don't get more than 10% of a textbook. So I will not overstep my, you know, uh, so because I cannot ask them to buy 100 textbooks, right? So I, I had to be very careful about how much I get from each book uh, uh, to be able to cobble it together to, to be an equivalent of a textbook. I have used a textbook in the past uh, that did not work out great. So I had to drop it and go back to my cobbling until I uh, this textbook came up. So um, since it, it goes only to 1800, uh, I only use the part that goes to 1800. Most of it is chronological. Um, and uh, but for the, the for the follow up course in the third year, I use the last two or three chapters as as background reading for them to, to for us to step into the long 19th century before going into the 20th century. So in many ways, I use a part of the textbook for the second for the sorry for the uh, third year course, uh, but uh, that it will be the main textbook for the first year course. I supplemented with a lot of reading. Uh, I supplemented with a lot of reading because usually uh, it's a flipped class. So which means um, uh, I most of the kind of factual background learning has to happen at home. Uh, and you have to count on students actually doing the readings. Otherwise, when they come to class, they'll be lost. Uh, usually it takes them a couple of weeks to get used to that idea. And then uh, quickly, at least at Cornell, thankfully, people for the most part actually read. Um, so I'm very lucky that way. Uh, and then in the classroom, we basically discuss uh, the main points and then get into the supplemental readings. Um, now, the reason a, a textbook is so fundamental, when, especially when it's a flipped class, is that you need to have something that will keep the student's attention while they are at home doing it on their own. Um, so a dry textbook or just a, a parts of a, a monograph that are not meant for an undergraduate student does not always work that well, mostly because they, they it just goes over their head uh, for the most part. This textbook I found really centered the experience of the student. Um, at its core, uh, so it's uh, it thought of what the student, who the student is. In this case, the student that we assume knows nothing, but most likely is in North America. Um, uh, but someone who's interested in Ottoman history, I should say that it's not like anybody can go into it, um, and it may it keeps you engaged with a lot of pictures. I don't know what the budget was for the University of Toronto. Bless them. I have to like beg for two pictures, tons of colored pictures and tons of colored maps. Um, and uh, what's great about them is that a lot of those pictures in the past, I had to actually find myself and, and put on board because in terms of primary sources for the intro class, I don't, uh, I rarely use text. I usually use uh, miniatures and, 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 and pictures and symbolic things for them to kind of try and analyze them as they go. And a lot of those pictures are actually in the textbook. So I would like be, so they would have seen them at home and then would come to class and discuss them. So I love that about the book. Um, there's just, and let me just look at my notes to make sure. Uh, there are, there, since I said that I need to get, it, and this is uh, up for debate about when you're teaching Ottoman history, whether you wanna go into pre-Ottoman history and how much do you need to go to pre-Ottoman uh, empire? I go deeply for three weeks for them to actually get the basic concepts that they need to know from the history of Islam, history of the Byzantine Empire, and uh, then the Seljuk Empire. Uh, so basically, we, we kind of concentrate on concepts that will come up later, even though Renee explains them and she has a good glossary. Uh, Debating those concepts, I find for me, for my class, is very important before we use them as if they are set in, in, in stone.
own. Uh, so how then the Ottomans would use them or pick them up as a state, uh, they would have already been introduced to the idea that in, in the first place, they are constructed and they're based in a specific kind of historical context. And when the Ottoman take them, they change them, use them the way they need to use them. So, um, uh, so uh, I still believe that it's important to teach those things. Those I had to supplement at the beginning. So, uh, and after that, I we stepped into the textbook. So most of the background reading was was fully on from the textbook, making my life a lot easier. Uh, the debates, historiographical debates, are touched on in the textbook, which is great, uh, um, and they are put in briefly. They, they used uh, I I get into them a little more deeply, such as the the. Um, uh, you know, the origins of the Ottoman Empire, or why did the Ottoman Empire succeed? And then we look at different debates, in, you know, so we read, you know, Kafadar to get into Koprulu and to get into, uh, and what Koprulu is talking back to and all of that, as a way of them understanding kind of what is at stake in what they're studying. Um, so those also I had to supplement. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and also I do two things when I'm using a new uh, textbook. I, I have a midterm, uh, like a midway, let's get a check-in. And then uh, at the end of the course, we get a check-in with the students to see whether the textbook, the way I'm using it is actually serving them well. And um, the reason the other textbook that I use, I didn't use again is because the, the reaction was mostly not. Uh, in this case, in both cases, they were on board and, uh, and I'm not just saying this because Renee is on my screen, really. They, it's, uh, so you basically ask them several set questions and then you ask them, would you recommend uh, using it again for students that you would recommend taking this course for? And for most of them, they said yes. So I'm using it again. So that to me is like the biggest uh, compliment to, uh, to a textbook you can have. Um, uh, so this is basically, I mean, I can go on and on about the difference about teaching it in at the American University of Beirut versus Cornell and, and how that worked. But I think I'll leave that to the to the question answer period uh, in if we when I get get there, because it's really more about how do you teach uh, Ottoman history in today's world to people that are not necessarily from the region or know very little about the region, even though they're from the region, AUB. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Now, uh, let me make a brief announcement about how we're going to proceed. I'm going to pass the mic to Renee uh, so that she could maybe say a few things about uh, some of the points raised because she uh, put something in the chat. So I think she could add a little bit in, in response. And then uh, everyone in the audience, please feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand function. Um, and then I will give uh, the mic in the order that uh, people raise their hands. If you are uh, camera shy, write what you wanted to say on chat and I'll be happy to read it. Um, and then uh, the speakers could respond. And then if you have things to say about the OTSA ballot discussion, please hold on. Uh, we'll complete this discussion all together and then uh, we'll stop recording and then we'll move on to that after. So, Renee, please, you take the mic and uh, anybody who has questions, would like to have some comments, raise your hands or go to the chat box. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty humbled here. <laughs> so I really appreciate hearing from my colleagues that I respect so much, um, giving me some positive feedback. So thank you. Um, I can say just a couple of things about, you know, at University of Toronto Press, um, what they had as guidelines. One of the things they wanted uh, was to make sure that I had a, what they called a narrative hook, you know, something, some kind of a theme that flowed throughout all of the chapters of the, of the, uh, of the book. And I, I mean, for me, the, the narrative hook for me in Ottoman history was this idea of uh, flexibility and adaptability. And I, that, that sort of ran through the whole text. In terms of images and maps and the budget for that, you know, I was originally quoted, I could use about um, 45 images and maybe 20 or 25 maps. And 
Um, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East and I managed to learn how to barter. <laughs> so I, I actually negotiated up quite a bit from that and, and pleaded a case um, for a lot of the images. And so we ended up with about 90 images and I think sort of uh, 40 or 50 maps, something like that. Um, so, and I, I mean, I think it really added so much. And, and the thing is that the University of Toronto Press also said, we want color images. We don't want black and white. And of course, sometimes when it's photographs, right, old photographs, that wasn't possible. But they actually wanted color photographs or uh, color images because that was part of this um, this series. So that just indulged me all the more. I mean, I was thrilled with that, especially with the kind of miniatures that we could reproduce. So, um, so that was that was really really helpful. Um, Justin McCarthy has um, that collection of maps that he did that, that Mesa has. You know, it's a CD that you can buy um, that has maps of you know uh, Middle East history. You know, from start to finish and. And we gained permission to use those. So whenever possible, that was what we used. It was really wonderful to do that. Um, but I also got permission from uh, from Dawn Chatty for her maps on refugees flowing into the Ottoman Empire. Um, and then sometimes I, you know, I had a map or two that I wanted to use, but somehow it wasn't quite what I needed. And the cartographer at the, at the University of Guelph in the geography department actually uh, did the maps for me. So we had um, we had a wonderful time with that. Um, I really enjoyed it. There, I, I regret that I don't have a, a, an image of the plan for the Berlin to Baghdad railway. I really wanted that one in and I had to give that one up. So I'm, I'm still kind of bitter about that. But um, but maybe in maybe in a second edition, I don't know. Um, and you know, there's some other um, revisions that I would like to do in the future. And I'm sure I'm going to hear from colleagues about things that I probably should have should have done. I know I don't think Victor Ostepchuk is here, but um, he already he, he's already compiling a list for me. So I'm a little nervous about what, what what's going to happen with that. But he, you know, when when he saw one of the maps that we did and, and Kiv was not quite in the right place on the on the banks of the river, he, he really got on on me about that. And so we tried to fix that. Um, but there's and, and I'm going to mention, I know my friend Faisal Hussein is here when I talk about uh, sheep and, and um, supplying the Ottoman armies and the cities with uh, requisite sheep numbers. I did not at the time have his book that talked about Ottoman herding associations. So that is going to have to go in the uh, in the revised edition down the road. So, I mean, our field is just growing all the time and it's it's so hard to actually keep up when you're teaching a lot. So. Um, I have, I'm, I'm thinking there's gonna be a new research all the time that is gonna be uh, necessary. So I'll, I'll be counting all, on all of you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I do not see any raised hands. Um, so I'm going to ask a question myself. Mm -hmm. so one of the things I worry about using in using a textbook is um, I put my readings in such a way that um, they would in at the end of let's say a three week period they would coalesce into enough material to write a paper about so that a paper prompt could be answered um, and a five to seven page paper could be written with the particular readings i assigned that sort of add to each other um, i'm wondering it was that possible in the classroom, those who taught it? And Rene, uh, while you were building it, did you consider also the question of what uh, people uh, would be, you know, asking their students in the classroom how the exams or papers would go? Yeah, you know, I, I like everyone else um, on the panel today, I actually supplement uh, um, my course with a lot of readings as well. It's just, it's, it's almost impossible not to in our field, right? When, when it's such a broad um, geographic and temporal sort of subject, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible otherwise. Um, and one of the things that I um, do in my class is when we get through, when we get into the, the period of Suleiman the Magnificent, um, I actually, and I'm, I'm sure people will be surprised, but um, I actually assign them to watch episode one of Mutasham Yuzu. And, and, and I figure by the time we get to that point, they have enough historical background that they've gotten from the proper sources that then they are, they watch that and then they have to critique the history in it. 
So that was one way to sort of deal with that. Um, and, and actually, I think a few of the students said they got hooked on the show. So I don't, I don't know if I want to take responsibility for that or not. <laughs> but it was a good exercise. A lot of them really liked it because they, they really got a chance to sort of think about what they had read up to this point and, you know, sort of pick at the, the, the media references and things that are in uh, Magnificent Century. So um, it's, you know, it was, it, and, and they can get really critical. They like being really picky and critical about things. I found that to be the case, even when they were reviewing some of my chapters, they really picked at me about certain things, which I, you know, um, I appreciated that too. So I, um, I hope that that is what people can do with this. I, I think Janet mentioned that, you know, she uses it as a, a sort of a launching board for, uh, for more deep um, reading and discussion. So, I, I mean, I kind of expected that because otherwise it would not be a short history. It would be a very, very long history to try and cover everything. And I would, I don't, I don't think I would be capable of quite that much. So um, yeah, I, I'm hoping that that's how people can use it. Thank you. Um, any one of the professors I, who it? Baki, I, um, so I, I guess I don't have them write every three weeks or so, uh, but you, you're on quarters, right? My, my course is, uh, we're 16 weeks. So um, I, I, I give them quite a bit of space, like about six weeks in before they have the first paper due. And for that one, um, I, for their first one, I had them, you know, analyze the decline thesis. Um, and there they compared, um, you know, they, they used a bunch of sources that we used in the class, but they also, um, yeah, so that was that one. Now the next paper, um, I had them, I also assigned, uh, you know, the 1875 Ottoman novel, um, Felatunbe and Rakum Effendi. And uh, it's just a short novel. They really enjoyed that. And, and uh, it was a great way to discuss questions of modernity or Westernization. Um, so Renee's book was helpful for that. It did serve as a good springboard, but I also showed them Ottoman political cartoons from Palmyra Brummett's piece, uh, Dogs, Women, and Cholera. They read, um, you know, various other articles uh, that kind of had to do with this question. And then the last assignment that I mentioned is, you know, their their critique of Ottoman Empire war machine. And um, Renee, I agree, like they they just were really thrilled to to tear it apart. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, my I, I really have just three main assignments. Sometimes what I have them do is instead of um, a lot of papers, I have them post discussion posts, they, you know, for each day that we meet, um, just to ensure that they do their readings and have something to talk about. And then they actually like that at the end, because um, I didn't do it for this class, though, because they had enough to do. But um, like, I'll have them post on, you know, online their discussion, um, like a response to the readings. And it's a space where they're not texting, you know, it's not like text speak, but it's not totally formal academic writing either. It's a chance for them to, you know, be a little informal and respond, like capture the main arguments. Um, and then also kind of think about how they connect to others and, uh, and they actually like it in the end because they find that then they've got like notes right there for everything when they want to draw on them later. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before I uh, pass the mic to Mustafa, I just want to have a little footnote here. In the book that you used, uh, the 1875 novel, I happen to have uh, gone through that with a graduate student who approached me to do something on um, modern Turkish literature. So we've been reading things for two quarters now, one on one. And that was one of the first things we did. Uh, in the English translation, one of the characters appears as an Arab, Arab slave. Uh, that translation should be corrected. The, 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 when they refer to an Arab, in the slavery sense of the 19th century context, what I actually what they actually mean is an African slave. I, I, I've noticed this and I thought it's important to underline 
uh, there were no, because the, in English reader, in the English language, wouldn't be able to tell that is what is meant. They would think it's actually an Arab person who's been enslaved, and that is not the case. It's an African slave, and that is actually important for that novel, that there is the African slave, and then there is a Circassian slave, the African slave being doing all this small household jobs versus the Circassian slave uh, sort of having a much higher status uh, as a very white person. Anyway, that was a very footnote, had nothing to do with the textbook, but I felt like I had to say that. Uh, Mustafa, please go ahead. Uh, nothing. I uh, um, so I I this is very interesting about the Arab Arab thing. I uh, I it's something that is at the core of my this book, by the way, about where, when does Arab Arab become uh, become uh, uh, really it's uh, it's code word for black. Um, anyhow, um, I do what you do, Baki, in the sense that I divide the course into three parts, kind of thematic parts uh, uh, that and more or less stick to chronology, but I try and focus on one theme in each of them. Uh, uh, one is uh, more historiography, um, uh, one is about the writing of history, and one is about the critique of history. And um, uh, uh, so using uh, Renee's textbook, I had to not follow uh, sometimes the the chronology that or the the order that Rene uh, uh, um, kind of ordered the chapters because though the depending on the theme I would have to, uh, some of the concepts that would come up in Rene's book earlier I would talk about later and vice versa so I had to make sure that I was aware of where those concepts come up in the textbook and where I was introducing them in the, in the course um, but and I uh, so yeah uh, so it's doable you just have to be aware you have to uh, not follow the order of the textbook um, from beginning to end Thank you, thank you. Mustafa, I can tell you that Arab had been used uh, as uh, with reference to black uh, as early as the 17th century, and I think it's earlier than that too. I noticed that in my study of um, the um, uh, Mullah Ali. Uh, Evran, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, regarding the questions, because there was a final, uh, there was a take on final exam uh, component of the class. So what I did was uh, to uh, tell students to read the introduction and the conclusion chapters before coming to class. They just did it. They had no idea why they were doing it. And in the class, I told them, if you were me, and after reading the introduction and conclusion chapters, what kind of final questions would you ask? That was my question to them. That was our my assignment to them. So we did it within the class in 40 minutes. They, they wrote down, uh, I put them in breakout rooms. They wrote some questions as teams, as groups. And I asked them the same questions at the end of the semester. So. And they used the introduction and conclusion chapters of Rene's textbook, which was great because Rene raises some questions in the, in the introduction and in the conclusion and students uh, use them in order to uh, build up their own questions, which they didn't know they were actually doing. Uh, this is what I did. And in addition to that, in order to show them the reflection of Ottoman uh, state on the nations uh, that Ottomans ruled upon, I kindly asked some of my friends in Serbia and Greece to provide me some excerpts from the history textbooks they use in Serbian and Greek national curriculums. So uh, they sent me some excerpts with the translations and I showed it to the students to let them understand what how Ottomans were perceived in countries like Serbia and Greece and how it is used in the textbooks. Uh, and, and that was very, uh, we had a very sentimental moment because I had three students with Serbian origins. And uh, after reading the uh, textbook experts, they, uh, uh, they, were, they were very sentimental, but it was a very great moment in order to help the students understand the Ottoman impact on the post-Ottoman era. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Evren, thank you so much. And I must say, I'm very curious about those excerpts in English translation. I'd love to have them if you, it is okay to share sure. them. 
Of uh, course, I will send. That, that is a very smart tool to sort of show how people perceive this very differently. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Ginny, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I have the weakest link on, on computers. So <laughs> if I come in and out, I will try to stay <laughs> afloat. Ginny, we lost uh, it. We lost the last thing you said. Uh, the, I wonder whether you might want to turn off your video and then. Congratulate you. I congratulate Chris. I'm so I was very envious of the uh, University of Toronto's approach to illustrations, and I congratulate you on how glorious the book is as a result. You know, we're in another moment of a class of civilizations that is being described as the reconstruction of the East West kind of uh, paradigms, which we have all been tackling now for uh, all of our academic lives. So it makes me want to ask, in what way your textbook or other textbooks, anybody else wants to comment on this, we have moved beyond the West and Islam dichotomy, uh, the class of civilizations which which we continue to live. And I do think that America, it's in the American DNA, this sort of uh, Islam as terrorists left us. Um, and the, the, shall we say, the impact of centennials, we've had a uh, war, we've had uh, uh, the Saint Hill, of course, of 1918, um, and even, what was the other one? The Greek Revolution, the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution, all of which I think is finding our, um, our histories bouleversé in lots of ways. It's just a toss up right now. So I'm kind of curious about how you think about that. Many. I hate to tell you this, but I missed the middle portion of what you were saying. You're, you're, it, it cut out. After clash of civilizations, you said Islam, and then after that, we didn't hear. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the, the most important moment, and I didn't. I, I don't think any of us heard it. I haven't quite figured out where to be, so this convey it conveys it to you. Uh, I, you know, the East versus West is being revived with the Ukrainian mm -hmm. crisis. Uh, the class of civilization is also being revived. With the, you know, so this is a real. Really a historical question. You're gone again. Can we escape this some way? The West and Islam remains fundamental. I'm still standing as a terrorist, just as Arab has stood as the terrorist. Have we dealt with this? You You've cut out a bit again, um, unfortunately. Uh, could you can you type don't it? it? Don't, don't, don't bother. It's okay. Don't bother. I'll, 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 I, I'll put I, it in the I, chat. I'll put I it in the chat. The yep. Probably the question is wondering about at a moment where East West tensions are, I mean, not tensions, but the depiction of political issues as deeply running tensions between East and West, essentialisms yeah. sort of emerging. How could we respond to this? with mm. our teaching maybe Jenny, yeah. would i be correct in interpreting yeah you've got it that's okay it. Yeah, I, think, I think that's what she was asking okay yeah right. um yeah so well you know in 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 writing this textbook i mean that's always been on my mind i think in all of my research um you know this question of east and west and how how um Orientalism tends to define so much of what people in the West understand about the East. And I'm, I was hoping that with this textbook, I was sort of trying to step away from that or at least illustrate that, you know, not only were the Ottomans in Europe from the very beginning 
and you know, part of Europe, involved in European politics, um, cultural exchange happened that often gets neglected or forgotten about. Um, I tried to sort of bridge the gap a bit um, in terms of that, but it's it's a pretty formidable issue. And, you know, even, in, and I'll just share with you an anecdote that Evren pointed out to me just to show you just um, in the, in the introduction, I have two images that I use um, that apparently are very controversial in Texas. <laughs> um, and, and one of them, it's, um, it's, um, it's, I think it's 0 0.02 or something. I don't know. It's, it's from um, a sort of soft porn graphic novel called The Lustful Turk that was super popular in England. It went through multiple publications, right? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Apparently there was, uh, Evan, you can tell us which university it was. I can't remember, but down in Texas, which of course is so ironic given everything uh, that's on in Texas. It's, it's, I don't remember the name of the university actually. My friend works in there. I, I, I have to make sure, but uh, in the meantime, I can tell you that uh, my friend who is a, who is a professor there, uh, hold on. Uh, the name is Texas Rio Grande Valley University. Okay, so he's teaching there and he wanted to use the textbook, but then because of the regulations in Texas uh, and because of the idea he had on mind that students would react, he couldn't use it by using the exact term because there was pornography in the book. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my, my book got banned in Texas. I'm actually a little bit proud of that, but um, but you know the, the, that is one image, and that the other image uh, in that same section is an image that was in a children's book about people and races, right? And I mean, if you look at it, and, and this was a uh, this was actually an image that a former student uh, found when he was writing a paper on opium in in uh, in the world. And it's an image in which the Turk is, you know, an opium smoker and, you know, all of this stereotypical stuff, right? And I mean, that was in a children's book. So, I mean, the, the kind of imagery and the kind of stereotypes that are so prevalent that feed into that whole East and West thing, it's really hard to get past. And I, I mean, I even see this now in, um, a I teach a course called Early Islamic World and I just had midterms. And I find, you know, when, when I ask a, a, a question in the midterm, um, how did Islam expand so rapidly in that early period? There are students in that class who still just want to talk about Arab warlike behavior. You know, they don't see the big picture, right? And, and I mean, the media is constantly bar bombarding us with the same kind of stuff. Um, and so trying to sort of combat that in the classroom takes, the, you know, textbooks, uh, uh, professors who can actually talk to students directly and sort of challenge some of those images um, in, a, in a better way. But I'm pretty pessimistic right now. I mean, I didn't think we were going to see another Cold War and look where we are right now, right? I mean, I, I you know, um, so the, the best I can do is to try and, you know, write the this book in a way that I think was an attempt to be very even-handed about the Ottoman Empire as an empire, just like empires behave. And, you know, they do good things and they do bad things. And, you know, there's not sort of a way to um, separate out the Ottomans and say, oh, see how unique they are. I mean, there's some things that are really kind of cool about the Ottomans, no doubt. But, um, but you know, they also, they also act on their society, their, you know, in certain ways that empires do. So I think the best we can do is to try and promote that idea of people being and empires being similar rather than constantly emphasizing dissimilarity and, you know, and exoticizing. Um, I think those are all problems that we still have. I don't know if that answered your question or not. It was, this was, I suppose, my attempt at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rune. I uh, just want to add uh, for the audience, if you're interested in this topic that the uh, uh, Ginny raised and Rune responded to. This was also one of the things discussed in last month's WhatsApp uh, that featured um, uh, Mark Bear's uh, not textbook, but like a trade book about Ottoman history. And he said he made a very conscious effort to sort of push the case that the Ottomans are part of uh, Europe. Uh, I see Janet's hand is up. Uh, Janet, go ahead. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Linda. Oh, Jeannie also uh, wanted to say something, maybe. Janet, you go ahead first. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I I just was going to say that the other day, this is something that we talked about, um, Renee, Mustafa, and Evren. Um, you know, uh, how do we how do we set this up? You know, how do we set the course up? How much time do we spend on Islam? Um, how much time do we spend on you know, kind of this pre Ottoman history? Um, and one, one thing that I've thought about is how to present, um, like, and I have this discussion that I've kind of, um, had in my mind, I have it with the students openly so that they can see where, where my personal debate is. Do I teach early Islamic history or not? You know, like to what extent, or how do I teach it? To what extent is, um, like I asked them, if you took a course on, uh, you know, modern Europe, would, would you have an early Christianity, you know, lecture to start that? And so to what extent um, do they need this? Uh, as most of them mentioned, some of those themes are important, you know, later. So it's always a debate. But what I ended up doing is I, uh, this time, just kind of to play around with that, is I assigned a couple chapters from Burbank and Cooper's Empires in World History um, to kind of situate it in empire. And I've actually found that my students, even at this, you know, Ohio University, most of the students, um, uh, I don't, they're, they're quite empathetic and they're, they really, um, they like, that they're breaking these stereotypes um, or, or that, you know, it's kind of myth busters in a way. Uh, they kind of like that and, and appreciate it. Um, and sometimes what I do is just barge in, no, I didn't with this, but some other courses just on the Middle East to start out with that nine minute film, Planet of the Arabs, that just kind of, uh, um, it's made by Jackie Saloum, an Arab American filmmaker, and it just goes right into these stereotypes right there. And so they get it like right off the bat um, for for that. But yeah, I, I started uh, kind of with empires in world history, a couple chapters from that to pair with some of Renee's the earlier parts of Renee's book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. I'm going to pass the mic to Mustafa and then to Linda Darling, who will tell us a little bit about uh, the source book that she's working on. Uh, but before Mustafa, I wanted to read Nabil's message for the people who might watch us later on YouTube. Nabil says, thank you, Renee. I've assigned your textbook and we'll see what the students think of it after spring break. On another note, and this is uh, sort of an announcement that I will hopefully remember to repeat, next week when I send my monthly message. Um, the Middle Atlantic Ottomanists Workshop Conference is scheduled for April 1st, 2nd, 2022. We have now set up the Zoom registration page and updated abstracts and schedule and other information on the webpage, uh, maow.umwblogs.org. All right, Mustafa, go ahead. Um, just uh, going back to what uh, Virginia just said, I I definitely think it is very very present, and but I don't think you can solve it with a textbook. Uh, to be honest, I think it's something that you you weave right from the beginning. It's it's a thread that you bring into the class right from the beginning, and I I want to say that in most cases students are really well meaning. They know there is something off. They know that they've been fed some kind of propaganda, but they're really not familiar with the terms of the debate. Uh, so part, so a lot of the times they read textbooks by um, uh, by scholars that are involved in that debate. So they are talking back to that debate, but the students do not know what they are talking back to. So the textbook a lot of times comes across as being defensive, like students are like, all right, fine, the autumns are fabulous, like, you know. So you have to, so you have to introduce them to the term of the debate and why it matters really, really early on, and and you remind them every single time so uh, uh, it comes up. 
um, and that's on the introduction level, uh, because they, then they have the language to discuss it back and forth and and to reflect back on the textbook that they're having and know what that uh, like the debate is really um, talked about in specific terms within at least, uh, I don't know, the academic environment. Um, the other thing I, I also try to dis, to kind of to take away from the East and West is confuse what's East and West. Um, and see how it changes over time, depending on what's happening. So literally my last class, which is a third year class, so people, so students are a lot more, um, I want to say, kind of sophisticated in the way they actually formulate their arguments. We had a, we, we, we looked on Putin's most recent uh, speech and to, uh, listened, to, it was live, it just happened to be live during my class time that his ambassador was talking in the UN. And then we read a couple of articles on the Ottoman uh, and Turkish neo-Ottomanism as well, and how they relate and how we define East and West and the other in, in similar ways. So what we talk about basically, what is really East and West and what is in reality uh, empire versus notions of non-empire in the, in the world. So kind of it's, it's confusing, it's taking away the terms to confuse them more. <laughs> so they'll come up more confused rather than, you know, where things clear as being East and West. Uh, making a, a connection between Ottomans and today is, I guess, uh, Crimea uh, was a point I raised yesterday in class about how that is the beginning of the Eastern question in uh, late 18th century. And maybe 100 years from now, people will write uh, the Russian annexation of Crimea was the beginning of the Second Cold War in Europe. Uh, I, I think Rene wants to say something on this very question, so I'm going to let her go first. Rene, please go ahead. Um, I was just going to point out, actually, um, the, the the images in that opening section that I that are you know pretty. And my colleagues um, at, at University of Guelph did say to me, I don't think you're going to get, you know, image 0 0.2 in your book. Um, I wanted to I wanted to insist on those two images because I think it illustrates very clearly to students just what we're dealing with in terms of Orientalism and and the stereotypes about East as a way to really try and break that at the very beginning, as, as um, Janet and Musafa were saying, you know, students are really they really. They, they want to understand this, this kind of stuff and be more open-minded, right? And, and understand what is behind it. And I actually teach a, a course on Orientalism. It's a fourth year seminar. And we use Zachary Lockman's book, Contending Visions of the Middle East. And we also use Thierry Hench's book, um, uh, I can't remember the title of that right now, the Imagining the East or something. And both of them kind of you know illustrate the, where this East-West thing comes from and how you can actually um, to sort of deconstruct it, you know? I mean, Thierry Hunch talks about the Mediterranean not as an obstacle between East and West, but a conduit between them, right? So, I mean, it's a lot of it is how you um, interpret the, the history, right? And interpret these ideas of East and West and you break those down and deconstruct them for students. Uh, and I think that that can help. Uh, on that note, I would like to... Um, remind people of Zeynep Çelik's new book. I think it came out of uh, Koç University Press. It's about uh, sort of how, what Europeans thought of uh, the Orient and how the Ottomans responded to it, the Ottoman, so, so how the Europeans don't understand. And then um, another thing that came to mind is uh, Gary Leiser has been translating some of the things that uh, Köprülü wrote, and they are also very clearly showing us uh, Ottoman intellectuals were very well aware of Orientalism and responding to it at the time. There is a question to Mostafa, but I'm going to go to Linda Darling first, and then we'll take the question to Mostafa, uh, and Mostafa can respond to it. Linda, please go ahead. Well, it's really encouraging uh, to see, to think about all of you people going out and teaching the Ottoman Empire and teaching people why it's important. Um, it's, it's something that's really blossoming nowadays and, and more, more to it. Um, in the line of, uh, the variety of Ottoman history, the political, the economic, the social, the gender, the cultural, all of these very, uh, very important parts of Ottoman history. Uh, that's something that our source book is trying to attack. We're trying to include uh, 
all different aspects of Ottoman history, documents about different aspects of Ottoman history, uh, not just the cultural, not just the political. Uh, and uh, we're also trying to cover the period from 1299 to 1923 uh, so that everybody who teaches a one semester course can use the whole book. Uh, we are, uh, we're, we just start, entered the editing stage. Uh, so there's still time to make contributions to it. Uh, we hope to have the full manuscript by the end of this calendar year. Um, the entries consist of a translated source, uh, hopefully a new translation so that we don't have to pay royalties on it, um, and a historical introduction and a couple of uh, study questions. It's aimed at beginners. It's intended to be used with a book like Renee's, a book like Doug Howard's, uh, and to supplement it. Um, what else do I want to say about it? Uh, my co-editor is a Europeanist who talks about European relations with the Ottoman Empire. Um, we have a scat of contributors, but we can always use more. Uh, we will at some point probably have to cut things down to fit into the uh, Cambridge University Press's word limit. Um, but I'd rather do that by condensing the, art, the articles that, rather than leaving them out. Um, so don't feel like, it, I'm inviting you to contribute and it, don't feel like you could, shouldn't contribute because it might exceed the, the span of the book. Um, it'll just be arranged in chronological order so that you can pick and choose among the uh, contributions, what ones you want to use. Um, we are hoping to link it to a website on which we can put, for example, the originals of the documents or more pictures. We will have pictures, um, half of them in color. Uh, they've given us 80 uh, illustrations. Uh, and of course, maps. Um, what else do I want to say? Some of the, some of the articles are actually about illustrations. They're about how to read a miniature, about calligraphy, about maps. Uh, and some of the illustrations will illustrate other articles. Um, we need more on women. So if you do, if you have gender stuff in translation, um, we welcome it. Um, I don't know what else to say. What what would you like to know about it? I I think this is plenty. Thank you so so okay. much. Uh, those those and, are and, our audience. Do members. please not don't hold back. Uh, email me if you are interested in making a contribution. Yeah, please. If you have things ready uh, that that could go English translations, that would be a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, now I'm going to read um, uh, a question that was addressed to Mustafa that he already responded, but. Uh, since we are also thinking about being watched on YouTube later, uh, Sabri asks, uh, Mustafa, where, what were some of the texts on Neo-Ottomanism you made them read? Mustafa, why don't you answer it on uh, Live. <clears throat> so I, uh, I assigned four articles, all to be read critically. Let me just, I mean, my students know that not everything I assign I like, and that's the whole point. So let me just <laughs> preface that. Uh, but um, so I assign, that doesn't mean the first thing I'm going to read, I didn't like. Let's just, you know. Anyway, so I assigned Multipurpose Empire by Nick Danforth, uh, Between Neo Ottomanism and Ottomania by uh, Edgin and Karakaya. And uh, what else? I, I assigned the introductory uh, chapter from Burbank and uh, Cooper uh, that talk uh, that kind of complicates the notion of. Uh, uh, what you know that complicates the notion of empire and 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 post empire if empire never ended, and um, and then I assign a really excellent article that has uh, 
nothing to do with the Ottomans, but it has to do with nostalgia and uh, collective memory about empire in Britain and France, but they use it. Uh, it's like a great theoretical intervention that they can just get into, uh, that they can then apply or try and think through Ottoman case, in this case, also the Russian case uh, by uh, Luthen, her name, where do I have it up here? Um, it's, yeah, it's by uh, Lorsen and it's called Nostalgia for Empire, uh, blah, blah, blah. There's more to it. I can send you the exact reference. Um, give me a second. If I can pick, okay. It is uh, The Nostalgias for Empire by Lorsen. And uh, it's uh, about, it's part of a forum called Historicizing Nostalgia. It's excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Linda, did you want to add something? Please go ahead. Yes, yes, on the subject of empire. Uh, in the modern period, the Ottoman Empire uh, may fit in with um, the genre of world empires. But in the pre-modern in the pre-modern period, the writings, the theoretical writings on empire do not help me understand the Ottoman Empire at all. Um, it, and I don't know if anybody has anything to recommend. Uh, I find that the, the closest parallel to the Ottoman Empire is the Roman Empire. And there's, there's stuff on the Roman Empire that seems to, to reverberate with uh, what the Ottoman Empire, how the Ottoman Empire is constructed, how it behaves. Um, if anybody knows good readings for the period before 1800, um, I would welcome them. Yes, I guess uh, co uh, comparisons between Romans, Byzantines, Ottomans would work better there. Um, we are at our 90 minute mark, unless there are any other questions from the audience. Let me see, going once, going twice, going thrice. All right, well, there are no more questions. I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Rene, especially uh, for writing the textbook. Uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, th this is the kind of thing we need, uh, you know, things that would make it easier to use in the classroom and also, you know, think about uh, how to address uh, larger audiences with it. Uh, make it easier also for people who might not be Ottomanists themselves, but maybe are interested in introducing something new that they don't know into the classroom through a textbook like this. So I really, really appreciate it. And I also like to thank uh, to all of our panelists who told the uh, book and then shared their experiences today. Linda, your hand was up. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd just like to announce that there will not be a meeting of WOW, the Western uh, Ottomanist workshop this year. Nobody volunteered to host it. Oh, uh, yes. Unfortunately, that is the case. Uh, there is a volunteer for next year, uh, but if there is a volunteer for the fall, we could still have a wall meeting in the fall, actually. Anyway, once again, thank you, Rene. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Evren. Thank you so, so much. And uh, I'm going to stop recording. Those of you who would like to stay to talk about the ballot, stay on. All right. Have a wonderful uh, week Those for those of you who are uh, a great weekend, actually, uh, for those of you who are here just to listen to textbook. Bye.